So you will uh, maybe know that last March, uh, Hewlett Packard pushed a security update to uh, Office Jet and Office Jet Pro printers that people had bought and installed in the wild. And tens, if not hundreds of millions of these users were alerted to the presence of a security update by notification on the little LCD on the front of the printer. And most of them ran the update. Uh, HP assumes that about two thirds of users run updates when delivered this way. I've spoken to some ex HP people on background. They think it's more like 95%. And the update contained maybe some security code, we don't know, but it also contained a hidden counter that was ticking down to mid September, a couple of months ago. And when it detonated, it activated this self destruct sequence in the printers that caused them to turn on this otherwise hidden feature that would cause the, the cartridges and the printer to do a cryptographic handshake so that the printer could identify and reject third-party ink cartridges and thus force people to buy their ink at a you know, 1 million percent markup, more expensive than vintage champagne. And um, no one was really sure what was happening when these printers all started spitting out their, their uh, pacifiers when they stopped accepting these, these third-party ink cartridges. Some people took like several known good cartridges and put them in, and when their printer wouldn't use any of them, they assumed the printer was dead and threw it in the garbage. Uh, but after thousands of complaints flooded into the third-party ink cartridge companies, they started to figure out what exactly had happened, this business with a, uh, a Manchurian candidate security update that was waiting to wake up in September. HP had deliberately reached into millions of customers' living rooms and offices and broken their lawfully acquired property to punish them for not ordering their affairs in the way that was most advantageous to HP shareholders. Uh, now, you may think that this is just kind of a garden variety corporate ripoff, but it has much deeper implications thanks to a late 20th century copyright law that has also lain mostly dormant for the last 15 years, but has come into its own in this decade in a way that's really toxic. I'm talking about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, which Congress passed in 1998. And it's a kind of gnarly hairball of copyright law. And it has a lot of different provisions. But the one I'm going to talk about today, it's section 1201. And that's called the anti-circumvention rule. Under DMCA 1201, tampering with the, an access control that restricts access to a copyrighted work can potentially give rise to both civil and criminal liability, and not a little liability. The criminal provisions allow for a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense for tampering with, with access controls on copyrighted works. Now, when 1201 passed, it was mostly designed to protect the business models of companies like Sega and people who made DVD players. DVD vendors could add region codes to their disks, and then they could use license agreements to make every manufacturer check for those region codes and respond to them so you can buy a DVD in one country and watch it in another. Now, note here that buying a DVD from the company that made it at the price that they charged and playing it in a DVD player is not piracy, right? It's the actual opposite of piracy. It's buying media and paying for it. And as for companies like Sega, well, DMC 1201 protected this Dreamcast business model, which was kind of a forebear to the App Store business model. If you were a company and you wanted to sell a Sega game to a Sega owner, Sega wanted you to press the CD on their presses, which charged a very high markup and effectively gave them a royalty on every game sold for the Sega platform. So this meant that everyone who played the Sega games paid a little hidden Sega tax, and that was buried in the price of the disc. It meant that Sega could decide who could make software for the platform they created, and uh, once again, remember that uh, buying a copyrighted game from the people who made it is the opposite of piracy. But because you had to break DRM to watch an out-of-region disc or to play a game that hadn't come from Sega's presses, those non-piracy acts could be punished under anti-piracy law. 